שלום לכם. היום שאלנו את עצמנו, למה מדענים מדברים עם הציבור? אילו מטרות הם רוצים להשיג, ואילו מטרות ראוי להשיג בעזרת תקשורת המדע. אבל כידוע, זה שמדענים מדברים לא אומר שמישהו מקשיב להם או מתרשם ממה שיש להם לומר. יש כמובן חשיבות לכריזמה, רהיטות וטכניקות שמאפיינות דוברים מוצלחים, ואותן תתרגלו במהלך הקורס. אבל אנשים אינם טיפשים, הם יודעים שלמדענים יש כל מיני סיבות לדבר איתם. אז איך אנשים מחליטים לאילו מדענים להקשיב ולמי להאמין? שאלה לא פשוטה, ולמזלנו נמצאת איתנו היום דוקטור פרדריקה הנדריקס, פסיכולוגית חינוכית מ-IPN, מכון לייבניץ לחינוך, במדע ובמתמטיקה שבגרמניה, שיכולה לעזור לנו להשיב עליה. וכדי שנוכל לשוחח, אעבור עכשיו לאנגלית. שלום and welcome to פרדריקה הנדריקס, from the IPN Leibniz Institute for Science and Mathematics Education in Kiel, Germany. שלום פרדריקה. היי, happy to be here. Frederica, do people generally trust science and scientists? So we have um, had surveys all over the world for about 30 or 40 years asking people how much they trust science. And um, in generally, we see that um, over the years um, and also all over the world, people trust um, science in general um, quite a lot. especially also compared to other systems in society, um, for example, journalism or politics. So um, while we see overall um, that trust in science is high and there are differences between uh, regions in the world. So for example, in Western countries, trust in science is higher compared to, for example, Africa or Latin America. Um, and in the Global Trust Monitor, where um, these comparative results are from, and they surveyed, I think, over 140 countries in the world, um, we can also infer that um, trust in science is related to how much people um, think that science will help people in their society. So um, while in Western countries, um, this perception is high in Latin America and in Africa, people don't think as much um, that science will help. them or other people in societies and we can also see that uh, trust in science is different for example between topics so um and when we look into for example german um the wissenschaftsbarometer in germany um they always ask um people every year how much uh, they trust in for example nanotechnology versus um genetically engineered food versus nuclear um energy and Um, here we can also see that um, trust in um, non-controversial topics is always higher uh, than when we ask about controversial topics. So if we ask people how much they trust science, we also have to make sure um, we know what people are thinking of when we ask um, whether they trust science. How people decide which scientists to believe and trust, especially when you have different experts saying different things? Um, there's actually different ideas about how people decide whether to trust science. So um, for one, um, we have um, perceptions of scientists as um, a group of people. Um, and for example, Susan Fiske has investigated a concept she calls the stereotype content model, um, where um, I think in the beginning it was a comparison of different occupations. So for example, teachers, mm-hmm. politicians, researchers, Um, were compared and assessed. And she found that, for example, teachers were um, assumed to be a lot uh, more warm than scientists, while scientists were um, found to be more competent than, for example, teachers and nurses. So um, we have uh, in her model um, two um, dimensions, it's warmth and competence, mm-hmm. and different occupations, different people are assessed along those two uh, dimensions. So um, this is a rather general, um, yeah, maybe default with which people come towards looking at different people and see, um, depending on the stereotypes they have about their occupations, for example, or their, um, what they know about these people, um, they will judge them accordingly. But then you can also look to different um, communication models. And for example, the research that we did um, with Anna Bromov um, together, In Münster, we came from an intentionalist um, communication model. So in these kind of models, people assume that the people they are conversing with have communicative intentions. 
-hmm. So they want to persuade someone, for example, or they want to inform someone, they want to deceive them, or they want to uh, keep information from other people. So um, from this, uh, um, this idea, we think that people, when they are in a conversation with someone, um, they um, on the go make up assumptions about what uh, the speaker is trying to convey to them beyond the words they're speaking. And they do this from yeah, looking at the content, looking at uh, the speaker themselves, what they know about them, but also looking at speaking behaviors. So um, in the research that we did, for example, um, a scientist that um, people um, met in uh, reading an online blog of the scientist, the scientist said, well, um, I have made overstatements in my blog article and I want to come here that we need more studies um, to be sure about those results. And this led to people judging them to be more integer and more benevolent. Mm. And we can actually see that these make up two very important um, categories on which people trust experts um, because they not only see um, if an expert is, uh, or a scientist is, is, has expertise on a topic, um, knows about that particular topic and not another one, for example, but also tries to keep up with the rules of their profession in science, for example, and be very honest and um, speak the truth, uh, disclose um, methodological um, mm. approaches, for example. And also uh, the benevolence part has a general uh, approach to um, being oriented to what the well-being of other people of society in general so these three dimensions expertise integrity and benevolence um, we find are central in those on-the-go inferences about uh, communicators scientists um, th that people meet online because online there's very sparse information usually so these are all um, characteristics of the scientists who are talking what about the receivers? What is the role of scientific literacy, for example, in people's judgment of whom to trust? Well, first we have to um, assume that trust always is a substitute for knowledge. Mm -hmm. So we trust other people because we ourselves can't, um, or especially in science, can't know certain things. So um, I am not a medical expert, so I have to trust other experts in medicine to give me information on uh, COVID-19, for example. Mm -hmm. But um, at the same time, I just talked about um, expertise, integrity and benevolence, and we can see that scientific literacy um, informs those kind of decisions. Um, for um, some um, uh, studies, we, we know that um, scientific literacy informs uh, this. So, for example, epistemic beliefs um, usually are um, uh, a predictor of trust in science. So, the amount to which we perceive science to be uncertain, knowledge to be unstable, um, this predicts also trust in um, a certain information because now we can decide whether our assumptions of what the science should be. Um, that it is not stable, it's not a certainty, um, will protect us from being critical mm -hmm. when we see information. Um, this has been shown in some studies. In other studies, it has been shown that we become more critical when we read about um, methods um, of science. Um, we are able to kind of um, take apart information and see that um, uncertainties are there um, for a reason, but also make us more critical of the results that are there. Um, this was a study and we did with little vignettes where people first read about methods of science and then read uncertainties and people, uh, we found that people were more critical towards uncertainty when they first had read about um, scientific methods. Um, but in general, I think um, a more um, uh, overall approach um, that hasn't been investigated as much is that people who perceive themselves as more knowledgeable, but also are more knowledgeable, have kind of um, more stuff to reason about science and also um, can, can judge the scientific endeavor uh, more deeply. And thus, um, I think, um, have higher trust because they know how much is behind a scientific result, for example, nice. and see this as better and um, longer lasting. 
So my last question then would be, as a scientist, what should I do to cultivate trust among audiences? So, um, of course, um, it is um, a problem uh, to, to think of uh, communicating trust as strategic, because, um, for example, in our studies, we have shown that um, when people perceive you as being very persuasive or wanting to be persuasive, this also raises skepticism a little bit. So I think um, the message is not how do I sell myself as trustworthy, but how do I make sure that I am as authentic as possible mm -hmm. and also know about the limitations and knowledge that I have, that I might speak about uh, psychology, for example, but not about COVID-19 and, um, and say very clearly the limits of my expertise or the limits of the studies um, that inform my judgments. But at the same time, I think that um, making sure that we also communicate um, that science is an endeavor that wants to find the truth and has conventions and uh, reliable strategies to approach the truth with a sound methodology. And um, that this is something that I can communicate along with my messages, how I did that, what were my methods, what do I know about the safety, the strength of my results. So um, I think those are important. Um, parts, but at the same time, and this is just a little note, um, recently uh, John Basley found that also openness um, informs the trustworthiness of scientists. So if a scientist presents themselves as someone who wants to listen to the audience as well, um, this is something that also makes the audience again trust the sciences more in this uh, yeah, recent study that John Basley did. Well, thank you for these important insights and thank you, Frederica Hendricks, for this interesting conversation. Thank you, Yedet.